Welcome to the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. I'm your host, Chris Kulmer. And well, it's been a pretty massive year in the international school music education community. Many in the community have gone back full throttle into a packed calendar of events and concerts and trips. Uh, and for our Northern Hemisphere community, we're now well into term three and heading towards end of year things. For our Southern Hemisphere people, we're now well into the new academic year and there's a lot happening from what I'm hearing. So either way, I hope this podcast is a useful addition to your commute, to your weekend jog or to your washing up routine, whatever, <laughs> wherever you listen to it. Um, we have lots of great guests in the pipeline and we'll keep exploring this unique world of international schooling and music education. So today I'm speaking with Dr. Liz Stafford and Liz is a strong voice in the music education world and has a number of connections into international schooling. She's well across the current research and trends and challenges in the UK music education scene. And I know many of her ideas and resources will resonate with current movements in international schooling too. So I've got a bunch of areas I'd like to explore with Liz. So let's get straight into it. Liz, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I first came across your work through Twitter and I'm sort of just getting into the Twitter sphere, if you like, over the last year or so. But I've noticed you've been quite active uh, on Twitter and you seem to talk about the UK music ed community and what's going on there. Can you tell us firstly a bit about yourself, your background and your background, I guess, as a music educator, but also as a consultant? Sure. So I guess I might have quite a similar career path to a lot of musicians in that I was absolutely convinced I was going to be a performer um, tried that for a bit Um had to do some teaching along the side because nobody could make any money out of performing in the early years. Um, and just dis discovered that I basically enjoyed the teaching loads more than the performing. I still do a bit of performing now, but the focus has definitely really shifted for me really quite early on in my career into, into teaching. So um, I'm a vocalist, so I started off as a singing teacher. Um, then while I worked for over here in the UK, we have, or at least at the time, we had things called music services, each local authority. So like each uh, sort of regional government area um, had their own music service. I worked for a couple of music services as a singing teacher, and I was able to also train and do my PGCE in primary with a specialism in music um, alongside that. And worked for a fair few years for different music services and schools as a primary teacher, as a vocalist in um, primary and secondary and then uh, the then government in the UK invented this massive training program called the Key Stage 2 Music CPD program. Not the snappiest title in the world, we have to say. <laughs> um, and I was lucky enough to be uh, selected to join the leadership team for that. So I moved into that sort of area um, in round about 2008. Did that until the funding ran out and then uh, also established my own business, Music Education Solutions, uh, which is what I do consultancy through now and have been doing for the last 15 years. Lots happening. Can I get clarification on a couple of terms here just for the community? Some will be very familiar with these terms, but two that I noticed, PGCE and Key Stage 2. Can you just define those two for us? Yeah, so PGCE is Postgraduate Certificate of Education. Um, so it's the kind of standard route, I guess, for people who have come uh, doing a degree, a subject-based degree, who then want to go into teaching. You do your one-year PGCE on top, and uh, you then get qualified teacher status to be able to work um, here in the UK. And Key Stage 2 is the uh, phase that we have here for children between the ages of 7 and 11, so at the top end of primary schools here. Great. As I said in the intro, uh, I said I'm speaking today with Dr. Liz Stafford. Can you tell us a bit more about the doctor in front of your name and what did you study for your PhD? Uh, yeah, I think I've never told anyone this, but I think people assume that my PhD is in education and it isn't. Ah. Uh, my PhD is in music. Yeah. And that does surprise people a little bit. But I've never actually told anyone it's in education. I'm not running around pretending to have good <laughs> qualifications that I don't have. Um, so I did my PhD straight after my music degree and it's in music performance studies. So uh, obviously I'm a vocalist, so specialising in the voice, I uh, looked at the vocal music of Henry Purcell. And it's a, kind of quite an interesting 
PhD in that because it's performance, you do a slightly shorter thesis. So I think it was 60,000 words instead of 75. And then you have to do a performance that demonstrates the things that you found out in your thesis. So it was quite a quite a unique course. There, there are a few a few more of them now, but at the time it was uh, Sheffield University where I went. It was one of the only places you could do that. And it was a really interesting experience. Sounds it. Okay, so in our community, we tend to have this nice mix of uh, international school music teachers that generally follow a British style, as it's known, a US style, or maybe IB focused curriculum, plus a few others even. So as I said in the intro, you seem to be kind of well across current conversations around music education in the context of UK and beyond. Could you, and this is a big question, so take it where you like, could you present for us some of the exciting developments that you see in the context of the UK and maybe some of the key challenges facing school music education also in the context of the UK? Absolutely. I I really like the fact that you said exciting developments because we have a lot of voices over here that just want to talk about the challenges. And some of those challenges actually are perceived challenges. They're not actual challenges. They're challenges that people have made up in their own heads. So it's really nice to be invited to talk about, you know, the good stuff. So we've we've seen a period of quite a lot of change over the last couple of years here in the UK. So um, England has had a national plan for music education uh, since 2012 now. That was due to expire in 2020. I don't know if you remember, but something happened in 2020 that kind of stopped a lot of things happening where they should have happened. So uh, we've only just recently had that renewed. So 2022, our new national plan, which runs to 2030, comes out. And that document is designed for everyone who is involved in music education you know, in whatever capacity to sort of come together and, and deliver the aims of that plan. And um, Wales has also had their first ever national plan that came out similar kind of time. So they're working on that now. Scotland recently, uh, they decided to make instrumental lessons free for all pupils. So they're working on that as well. And um, so there is there's, there's, there is lots of good stuff. And actually, um, even in, in the Channel Islands as well, Jersey and the Channel Islands also working on their own national plan. So, you know, policy wise, it's been quite a good time, I would say. Some perhaps of the issues we have here, we have wider issues around budget, around teacher recruitment and retention. Um, there's definitely been an uptick in the number of music teachers I know who've gone off to teach in international schools. So you guys have obviously got it much more right than we have, perhaps. It's a much more um, exciting and, and uh, you know, uh, something that people are, are much more drawn to, I think, than teaching in uh, in state schools here, perhaps. And we've got, you may know, we've got teacher strikes happening and all kinds of stuff happening. So there's a there's a sort of wider systemic issues around education, which obviously bounce down and affect music. But I would say the sort of the, the music specific challenges that we have, I would say, are there's this kind of philosophical debate, which has been going on certainly for my entire career and probably before that, about whether... In primary schools, we have generalist teachers. So I know in a lot of international schools, you'll be a subject specialist, you'll teach all the way through. And equally, there are obviously international schools where you do have that like generalist class teacher um, in the earlier years and then move into subject specialism. But here, all of our primary school teachers are generalists. And I say that carefully because some of them will go, well, I'm a specialist in this subject, but they are also teaching other subjects, essentially. So the way our primary school system uh, for five to 11 is set up is that you basically have one teacher, the class teacher, who teaches every subject to their class for the entire year. And um, music is one of those subjects where I think people feel like, sometimes people feel like you need a specialism to teach it. I'm aware of the audience here. I'm still going to say what's in my brain, which is I don't think that's true under all circumstances. I think you can be trained as a generalist well enough in music. You can have in-service training, which is helpful enough for you to be able to deliver the kind of music that we do with children between five and 11. The secondary is a whole different ball game. And of course, if you have got a music specialist in those earlier years, you will get you know, a different experience. It's not to say that we shouldn't have specialist teaching, but there's a real divide at the moment here where people think that all of the problems to do with music in the entire world ever can be solved by just making specialist teachers in primary schools, which, you know, I think is a dangerous game myself. I'm not I'm not really, really, you know, 
I don't know, I'm trying to, why am I trying to be careful with my words? Because you guys aren't in the UK. <laughs> so what I like, I just think it's wrong. I think people are wrong. <laughs> I think that, you know, it, we could have specialists, we could have non-specialists. As long as you treat them in the right way, it can still, it can still work really well. We also, I guess, here have a bit of a thing about around knowledge rich curriculum some of your listeners i know will have experienced that as well it's a sort of movement that's come seems to have come from the us definitely really heavily um infiltrated the dfe here the department for education and and is sort of steering government policy a bit for a skills based subject like music the idea that the way that you show you've learned something is by memorizing facts is not overly helpful so there's that that we're sort of trying to fight against at the moment and we also have this really interesting debate going on around the place of classical music in education. And I guess that's probably a worldwide thing as well. But certainly we have lots of predominantly classical musicians, performing musicians, being very, very, very vocal on Twitter and in uh, newspapers and magazines about how schools aren't teaching classical music and how the classical music industry is basically falling apart because teachers aren't doing their jobs properly. I don't think any of that is true either. Um, so if you, you know, if you are getting more used to looking at Twitter, you'll see me saying these things more and more frequently and more and more angrily <laughs> as the months go on, I think. Great summary. I've seen a few of these movements. I heard about in Wales, there's a instrumental program rollout happening as well. Is that something you're yeah. across? That's yes, that's as part of their national plan. So it's the idea that that they're going to get more instrumental teaching into schools. Yeah, through these mm. uh, programs, um, first experiences, I believe they're called in Wales. Uh, we've had something similar for a while in England. Um, whole class instrumental teaching or whole class ensemble teaching, sometimes called. So just the idea of getting as many kids in one room as possible and teaching them an instrument because it's because I think as they're finding out in Scotland and you know I'm not. 100% on exactly what's happening in Scotland but I think the problems that they're having there currently certainly anecdotally is this idea of it's all very well saying every child can have an instrument every child can have an instrumental lesson it's all free but how do you pay for that where do you find the instruments where do you find the teachers how do the teachers get between the schools um it, you know in, in in order to be able to deliver as many lessons as possible and so England and Wales and Jersey and the Channel Islands as well have very much gone down the route of let's have multiple children in a room let's have a whole class or a very large group and teach them all at the same time if our listeners uh can think back i think it was episode four we spoke with paulette wilkinson who worked in international schools for a long time and she's gone on to now be working in wales on this rollout of the uh i can't remember what you just called it first i think it's first experience first experience i'm 90 yes. percent sure that's yeah. what it's called so listeners can go back and have a look at that episode and you can hear sort of Paulette was just about to start that program and I've just spoken to her recently and she said it's it's big but it's quite amazing what's happening so that's quite cool. Can I touch on this classical music debate thing a little bit? You said I'm not sure it's true or you can sort of help with my paraphrasing there but where are you at with that debate if you care to dive in? Where do you where do you feel it is uh, either in the context of the UK and these Twitter debates at, or even just personally based on your understanding of music education i think saying oh i'm not sure was probably polite uh i know it's not true and it irritates me um because you never see teachers saying oh we're not doing enough classical music it's always it's always classical musicians and they have a vested interest obviously and the classical music industry is as far as i'm aware and i'm not an expert in it you know from what i've picked up in pretty dire straits in terms of audience numbers. Um, there's been a lot of funding difficulties here as well recently. So, you know, I, I understand that it's a, a difficult time for anyone who's trying to make a living out of classical music, but the problems that they have in classical music are not caused by schools. Anybody who's been in a school will know that if anything, they do too much classical music, mm -hmm. if that's even if that's possible, possibly a thing. Particularly in primary schools, I think we tend to default to classical music because at that age, the age of the children, you know, five to 11, it's really hard to bring in things like pop music because of the lyric content, because of the themes of it, Good because point. of the, even things like the lifestyles of the artists. Um, and we all know that our children are listening to those songs. We all know that they are doing that outside of the classroom. But to use it for an educational purpose kind of sanctions 
those sort of aspects, which is a bit tricky. So a lot of the time, schools avoid doing that, and they do loads and loads of classical music because it's, it's there's either no words or they're foreign words and we can't understand them, or you know it's it's something that is so far removed that we don't have to worry about the um, the lifestyles of the people who wrote the music, which is a good thing because if you add up all the composers who died of syphilis, there's quite a lot of them, <laughs> and you probably wouldn't necessarily be wanting to you know. Uh, spread that kind of lifestyle around your primary school children but because it's hundreds of years ago we you know we can gloss over that so I think it is happening I know it's happening every school I go into it's happening in I've been to uh you know classical um kids proms and the Royal Opera House which I've been doing a bit of work with recently and um, had a school's matter day that was absolutely packed out and they had loads of schools on the waiting list and that happens year on year there is no way that schools are not doing classical music what I think is happening is schools are doing exactly what they should be doing according to our national curriculum. So our national curriculum says you should listen to music in a range of, from a range of styles, genres and traditions. And that's what schools are doing. They're doing a balance. They're doing classical music. They're also doing pop much more predominantly in secondary because of all those issues we just spoke about. Um, but in primary as well, they're doing musical theatre. They're doing different music from different places in the world. And... There is this, um, how shall I put this politely? There is this misconception amongst some people in society that classical music is like the pinnacle of all music making. And classical music is the highest form of art and the best type of music. And I think because of that attitude, when we teach things that aren't classical music in school, even if we're only doing that part of the time, these people say, well, why are you doing that? That's pointless. You should be doing proper music. And we know, you know, anyone who's a musician knows that's not true. There are there are amazing pieces of classical music. There are also amazing pieces of jazz music. There's amazing gamelan music. There's amazing, you know, uh, West African drumming music. All musics I think of as maybe like different different languages, different little separate different languages. And you've always got, you know, in England, we've got Shakespeare. Um, but in uh, France, they've got Victor Hugo. Um, you know, everybody's got their cultural capital, I suppose, their kind of pinnacle of each different language or each different art form. And it's not the case that, you know, just because you're a classical composer, that puts you above everybody else. That's just not true. And that is the crux of the issue, I think, is that lots of people have grown up with this idea that classical music is better than everything. Therefore, if we're not doing classical music all the time, you know, we're failing our children. And then they extrapolate that into fewer people are coming to our concerts or our audience are aging. That must be because the teachers aren't doing their jobs properly. And I don't think it is. Okay. I have a few different ways we go here, but I think I'm just going to take a hard left and start kind of a, on a different track, which is a bit about what you are offering with music education solutions. We have a bunch of international school music teachers, or at least people that are interested in this world that are often applying for jobs or interested in applying for jobs, but might not have the necessary qualification for their CV. And we got chatting a while ago about a level four cert certificate for music educators, which you guys offer through Trinity, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So could you tell us a bit more about this and how this qualification might prepare an aspiring international school music teacher for the classroom? Yeah, so the Level 4 Certificate for Music Educators, as you said, it's underwritten by Trinity College London. Uh, they're the validating body. And it actually came out of England's first ever national plan for music uh, because it was felt that there were a lot of people who were operating as maybe instrumental teachers or community musicians or workshop leaders who didn't necessarily have a teaching qualification. So it was it was developed with that context in mind, but it very quickly went international. Uh, we've now had at least one person from every continent apart from Antarctica um, do it. So if you're in Antarctica and you want to do it, you want to just help me tick my box off, then please, please come to me. Um, so it is a distance learning, obviously. It's all completely online. It takes, it's flexible, so it takes up to two years. Uh, but many people do it in less than that. The average is about 12 to 18 months. We've had some people do it in as little as eight months. And there are various modules. So there's things on reflective practice, on uh, musical development, on planning, on assessment, on behaviour management, 
um, on equality, diversity and inclusion and on safeguarding as well, but all within a musical context. And the entire thing is context specific. So um, wherever you are in the world, whatever kind of system you're working underneath, and um, it's not the case that, you know, when you look at our safeguarding module, you have to learn about safeguarding in England. You apply how safeguarding works in your own context, and that's how you are assessed. We've had a fair few international students go through it now. Uh, we've always had really positive feedback from people working in international schools. There certainly seems to be a sense that having a British qualification is quite a, a useful thing, perhaps, for, for people. And the general feedback we get is that it's really good for generating new ideas, for developing your practice, whether you are brand new to teaching or whether you've been teaching for a few years. It just kind of helps you think about the things you do and why you do them that way and whether there's a better way to do it. I love that it's context specific. So you're saying that, say, someone is in Thailand, they're an instrumental tutor, which we often get people that are working as instrumental tutors. They want to maybe upskill and move into the classroom. Tell us a bit more about the context specificness for, say, someone in Thailand, instrumental teacher. How does that apply? Yeah, so obviously because it's a validated qualification, everyone has to um, kind of achieve the same benchmark. So everybody has to show that they have uh, met all the criteria, but they are spe- the criteria are specific to where you are. So um, the example I gave before about safeguarding, there's bits where you have to show that you understand safeguarding legislation. That would be the legislation wherever you work. Your you create a portfolio of evidence, so it's not like essays and things. It's um, shorter tasks and things like submitting lesson plans and reflections on your teaching. So all of it is grounded in the work that you currently do. So as long as you have, and we have had people do it who are only teaching one to one currently. As long as you have, we usually say at least three pupils if you're in a one to one situation. So that if two of them drop out, you've still got enough teaching experience to be able to achieve the the course. Or, you know, a little bit of teaching, a few groups, you know, a a couple of days, maybe in a school, you will have enough time to be able to use that to create your evidence. Uh, There's a unit on equality, diversity and inclusion as well. And we're very well aware that obviously every different um, region has their own different legislation around that. So, again, it would be specific to in your situation where you are currently working. These are the things you have to bear in mind. And yeah, it's it's the general concepts are fixed, but then the examples are context specific and the way that you show that you've met those criteria is context specific. And that applies in the UK as well, because we have people who are primary teachers. We have people who are community musicians, workshop leaders, instrumental teachers. Um, some of them are working in schools. Some of them are working privately. Some of them are doing groups. Some of them are doing you know, different things. So wherever there is an example of something in one of our learning guides, there will be multiple examples. So it looks like this in a classroom. It looks like this with a small group instrumental. It looks like this in a workshop um, so that everybody gets a little bit of advice and help that is specific to their context. Nice. And each person works with a mentor, right? Yep, that's correct. So uh, you get assigned a mentor at the beginning of the course for international school based uh, staff. We do have uh, a couple of international teachers, um, so they will understand how international schools work and they can help you with that. And they will help you to decide uh, because the course is so flexible, which order you want to do everything in. Because You have to start at the beginning. You can start mm-hmm. in the middle. How are you going to evidence things? How long it's going to take you? You will then at some point when you're ready to do so, you will video yourself teaching and your mentor will um, observe that as part of the course, give you feedback, help you sign off criteria and is generally there to support you, to chat to you um, via Zoom, uh, via email, um, whenever you need them ready for as long as you're on the program. If people want to jump on there now, they might be listening to this going, where do I find out about this? Let's just quickly talk about that. So where do, where do we go? Where do we find out about this course and, and register if we want to? So best thing to do is go to our website, which is musiceducationsolutions.co.uk. And right up at the top of the website, there's a tab that says CME. Click on that. All of the information is there. The application forms, the course brochures, the email address to ask us any further questions, all on that page. So that would be the best place to go. CME. What does that stand for again? Certificate for Music Educators. Got it. Great. So uh, in Music Education Solutions, I remember I also shared with the community, and it was quite well received, the Primary Music Magazine. 
um, which has lots of resources and articles and all sorts of stuff. Tell us a bit more about that and how does the community access that primary music magazine? Maybe how do we subscribe to it? Keep an eye on what's uh, coming out in that. Yeah, so it's a completely free online-based magazine. It comes out three times a year to coincide with the middle of our terms here in the UK. So it comes around, around about half term, as we call it here. And it is on the issue platform. But if you Google Primary Music Magazine, it's one of the first things that comes up. And you can also find a link to it on our website as well. It has a mixture of different features and things. So we uh, encourage teachers to write articles about how they do things in their school or share lesson plans or um, ideas for resources. We also obviously have stuff from partner uh, partner content from people who, you know, publishers or resource providers, that kind of thing, workshop uh, providers talking about the things that they offer as well. We try and feature a mixture of more academic stuff as well. One of my little bugbears, I guess, about primary teaching, which I think goes back to all this other stuff about classical music and you know, specialists and stuff is that often people treat primary music teachers as if they are primary children. Like they think they're a bit thick, for want of a better word. And often with music courses and things and with music resources, you know, you go along and it's all, oh, let's behave like children and clap and sing and that kind of thing. And sometimes that fu- that's fun. But certainly when I was teaching, I really struggled to find anything that was sort of academic or research based. And we've got to remember that teachers have been through a degree as a minimum, probably a postgraduate teaching qualification in the majority of cases. These are not people who are going to run away from big words. Uh, they want to know the theory behind things. And um, so with the magazine, we always try and carry some content that is about research or is about theory and pedagogy, because we think that's really important. You know, teachers don't just want, oh, here's a song, do it how I showed you how to do it. They want to know why and how and what they should do next. So we would love, actually, some more content from international schools. So if you're listening to this thinking that sounds great, but I don't want to read it, I want to contribute to it. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm currently preparing our issue, which comes out in June. And then the next one will be coming out in October with a deadline of the end of September for um, submissions. So if you've got an idea for an article or you want to share something, again, best place, best thing to do is go to our website and along the top, just past where you see CME, there's a thing that says contact us or get in, might say get in touch, can't remember. Click on that, you get a form, send me your ideas and we'll have a chat. Love it. What a great opportunity for the community. I'm excited to see some people, yeah, come forward with some ideas. Fantastic. Okay. So is there anything else in the music education solution kind of world, resources, courses, content that you provide that you want to share? Yeah, uh, we do. We'll basically do anything for it, for anyone pretty much. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> other, other than tell them that classical music is the best form of music ever. Um, <laughs> So we run a a program of webinars about all different kind of topics uh, to do with teaching uh, that are relevant to primary or secondary or instrumental, sometimes all three of those. We um, have the magazine, obviously, and the CME, but we also have a suite of online self-study courses. So for international teachers, those might be of interest because obviously you don't have to be in the same time zone or stay up in the middle of the night to access those. And we have streamed them into, uh, they're coded basically, so you can see whether they're suitable for international or whether they're suitable for UK. And by UK, we mean anyone using a UK curriculum. So if you're in a British international school, all of the courses will be relevant to you pretty much. Um, But if you're working under a different system, then perhaps just the international ones. And yeah, I would just encourage people to just have a little look there, see if there's anything that they they like the look of and um, and maybe book themselves on and, and see if it suits them. I'm guessing go to the website and go past CME and Primary Music Magazine and you'll find that. Yeah, it says courses. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liz, thank you so much. I really enjoyed all of that. I mean, I think we could have gone down many rabbit holes in terms of some of those uh, exciting things and challenges in the UK context. And I think for international school music teachers, we very often come from all over the place, increasingly as well. You know, teachers are coming from all sorts of countries. And myself as an Australian, I remember coming into a British style international school going, what? A PGCE? And what's Key Stage 2? And I think it's one of those things that is really valuable for us to hear from someone like you that has such a deep understanding of this context. So thank you so much for 
for sharing all of that and for, for taking us on that journey. Is there anything else you want to share? Any questions, any comments before we wrap up? No, I'm not really other than to say thank you for having me. And, you know, I, I, uh, I appreciate that I know a lot about the UK. I'm still learning about international schools. Um, so it's great to, you know, become part of this community and be able to actually learn from you as well. Um, so if you've listened to this and gone, what is that woman talking about? <laughs> and you want to put me straight on anything, um, I'm I'm always open. I'd love to love to talk to you. As as uh, as you said, I'm on Twitter quite a lot. Uh, my handle's at Dr. Liz Stafford. So if you want to start a conversation with me, that's the best place to find me. Fantastic. We'll put that in the show notes so people will know M-T-I-S. I didn't even get the acronym right. M-T-I-I-S dot co. Jump over to the episodes. You'll find all the information about today's episode with Liz and her Twitter handle and music education solution website link, etc. Liz, thank you so much and looking forward to keeping in touch and maybe chatting again one day soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. Listen to other episodes by visiting mtiis.com or learn more about our community on Facebook by simply searching for Music Teachers in International Schools. If you know someone who you think I should get on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me at chriskulma.com, C-H-R-I-S-K-O-E, lma.com. See you next time.